The revolution will be individualized. Lessons from the King, part two. Brother Kamal, what's going on, man? Hey, what's up, man? What is going on? Ready to do this? You ready to pick back up where we left off? Talking about Martin yep. Luther, the King? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure am. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. So for those of you who have not yet seen part one, going on over to the YouTube channel. Assuming you're not watching it there now and look up part one to get the back part, the back story. And we're going to do like we did last time. We're going to take three lessons. And, and for each lesson, I'm going to share some context behind it. And then Kamal, Kamal and I will riff on things that we can learn in terms of living freely and fully in our own individual lives from the I life. Wanted to say real, I wanted to say real quick, um, addressing a few comments that we've been getting. One, people want the merch, TK. People want the Revolution of One merch. <laughs> so I'm telling y'all, I've been advocating for this from the beginning. We are going to get y'all some merch. What, what they it's want? Record. What's the word? Uh, so um, they want a revolution will be individualized, T. Uh, they just want some other revolu Revolution of One merch. So what I was thinking is that we would send it to all the loyal, all the, all the day one fans first. Yep. Um, but yeah, we we will. We're gonna have some merch, y'all. I, I got y'all. Trust me. Got to give the people what they want. <laughs> <laughs> you should have hey, went man. into singing. There's no scandal, man. There's no scandal with having a song in your heart come out. Ain't no scandal with that. <laughs> Let's go to lesson number one. <laughs> he was a great student not just a great speaker check this out instead of finishing the 12th grade and going through a formal high school graduation dr king was accepted into and enrolled at morehouse college at age 15 where he completed a bachelor's degree in sociology he was a valedictorian of his class at crozier theological seminary given his rich interest in academia it makes sense that Dr. King graduated at the top of his class. He was named valedictorian and honored with a fellowship that covered part of his graduate study expenses. On top of receiving two bachelor's degrees, one in sociology from Morehouse College and the other in divinity from the theological seminary, King went on to earn a PhD from Boston University in 1955, making him a doctor of philosophy. As if earning three degrees as a student wasn't enough, Washington State University reported that Dr. King was awarded honorary doctorates from Howard University, Bard College, Yale, Wesleyan, and many other higher education institutions across the U.S. and the world, totaling at least 20 degrees. This one is important for me because Dr. King is such a great speaker. And he's so charismatic that it can be very easy to do to him what we do to so many people who take the time to master their craft with a level of meticulousness and precision. And that is we can say, oh, what a gift from God. Oh, what a natural talent. And no, this brother put in the work to engage ideas at a high level and to improve his communication skills and to make himself subject to other thinkers and experts who would push him and challenge him. You and I talk about this theme a lot when it comes to sports, people like Mamba, people like MJ, people that are students of the game. They're not just naturally athletic. They didn't just come out of the womb gifted from God with quickness, with agility, but they actually put in the time to pay attention to details at a level that most people will ignore. There was a story, so I, so I went to Western Michigan University and the chairman of the comparative religion department was a man by the name of E. Thomas Lawson. And I did an independent study with him where I would meet with him on Fridays and him and I would talk about different things and I would do research with him. And he, he, he used to tell me these stories. And he told me how when he was in grad school, he met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he said that um, there was a special group of grad students, about 15 of them, that had a chance to sit down and have lunch with him because Dr. King came to uh, speak at the college. 
And he says when they when they sat down to have lunch with him, they were asking him questions about race and about civil rights. And then one of the students there asked him a question about philosophy. And Dr. Lawson said that you saw this relief come over Dr. King's face. And he said, I'm so glad you asked me about philosophy. I never get to talk about this kind of stuff. People only want to talk about civil rights and religion, but this is fun. And then the dude just began to talk with them about like hardcore abstract philosophy for like an hour. And that's just one of those things that you don't see in the highlights because what a person is famous for isn't always the equivalent of everything they have to offer. It's just, hey, that's that one speech we remember you for, or that's that one quality that stands out so strongly, it's easy for us to assume that that's all you were about. But this guy was a true scholar, a true researcher, a true thinker. And I, I think that's a, a lesson for us in terms of whatever it is we want to do in life. Never allow your potential to be limited to the role that you play or to the talents that people recognize. Appreciate when you get recognition, but always strive to be more than your bio, always strive to be more than your brand, and always strive to be more than whatever that thing is when people talk about you and say, yeah, he's our guy for that. Yeah, she's our lady for that. I think when it comes to being a dynamic leader, a dynamic speaker, a dynamic, you know, anything, it's important that you pursue your passions and you pursue things that you're interested in to make yourself dynamic. Because if you were only going to lean into the thing that maybe comes naturally to you and you develop that, or maybe you were only going to lean into the thing that the world or that your community needs you to become. So for MLK, obviously this was a civil rights leader. If you're only going to lean into becoming that, then I think you lose the depth that really impresses and and um, j j just gets people to, to see you as something greater. I, I, I think Dr. Martin Luther King, because of his depth, because of the kind of man that he was, because there was so much more to his character that meets the eye. And I think, you know, w when you're trying to mobilize people, when you're trying to um, get something going, you're spending a lot of quality time with people. People are getting to know you on a deeper level. And it it only impresses them. It only uh, reassures them. It only gives them confidence that you are that person because you're 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 so much more than just meets the eye. And I think that is so true for any of us as we are pursuing the thing, you know, that has the, the potential to make us uh, this really impressive person. Um, we should cultivate the things that we're also interested in. We should cultivate the things that make us come alive um, and, and, and give us that depth of character. You see this on social media all the time, actually. You see people who, you know, might be known as that guy for, you know, maybe talking about this particular thing. And they, they cultivate this Instagram curated uh, image about themselves that they're this high and mighty person um and a lot of it is built off of this one thing that they're known for but i've heard stories like you know that person in reality is pretty basic they're they're just you know they're like they kind of inflate themselves based off of this one area of success to make it try to stretch to this these different components of their life and to me that's that's kind of boring like you you have so much uh potential to be so much more. And even if that isn't the thing that draws the spotlight, it's the thing that's going to make you um, just a dynamic person, just just somebody who is interesting and and captivating. And so to, to me, I, I never want to pigeonhole myself into one lane or to, to one avenue, um, just because, you know, that's what people are recognizing me for. You remind me of this time when I was in college, I, I got like an F in this anthropology class. This was my, I believe my freshman year. I was a theater major at this time. And all I cared about, man, was, was being in the plays, going to rehearsals and doing that part of things because I really enjoyed that. But I'm flunking my anthropology class and my professor wants to see me. And so I go to her office hours to talk with her. She's like, what's going on? And I just let her know pretty casually that anthropology ain't my thing. 
And I just, you know, care about doing the theater stuff. So I don't really try at this. And she says something to me that I never forget, man. She says, well, I don't think the world needs any more actors who don't know anything about anthropology. If you want to be mm. a great actor, you need to be a great human being. And that hit me like a ton of bricks, man. I'm sure there are some successful actors out there that don't know anything about anthropology, but that spoke to me because it was a moment of letting me know that my role doesn't define me. My job doesn't define me. My occupation doesn't define me. Not even my dream defines me. It's my potential that defines me. It's my capacity to be all that I can be that defines me. It's my capacity to be bigger than any role that I play at any given moment. And that understanding of everything that you learn in life, everything that you commit yourself to understanding is something that will benefit anything that you do. And, and, and everything. no matter what your dream is in life, you never want to say, all right, I'm only going to study. I'm only going to learn. I'm only going to be mindful and pay attention and focus on growth when I'm in the middle of doing that thing I love. It's got to be like, no, the whole world is going to be my classroom. And whether I'm studying anthropology or I'm in a theater doing a play, I'm going to take both of these things seriously because I'm not the anthropology student, nor am I the theater person. I am my potential. And those things are roles that I bring myself to. And the, the life of those roles comes from me and the investments that I make in myself. And to me, that's what this brother embodied. For sure. I, let, can we also point out the fact that he was 15 going to college? I mean, I, I was starting freshman year of high school. <laughs> <laughs> like, this cat is four years ahead, like already sitting in a classroom with adults, young adults. And like, just, I mean, to me, what that really says is that because I, like I've known other high schoolers who have gone to college and one mm -hmm. of the things that they're often uh, conflicted with is that like they're not necessarily accepted by their peers uh, because like you're the the weird high school student. Like you might not have the level of uh, maturity um, to, to to really understand um, maybe the social dynamics like you might be able to interact with the educational material and and the curriculum, excuse me. But in, in terms of uh, the environment, a lot of times <clears throat> it can go either way, you know, they can either uh, become really uncomfortable with that space and, and that affect their academic um, performance, or they, they can thrive in this space and, and just really lean into it. But either way it goes, I feel like in order to, to take a step that like that, you have to know that you have a ton of potential and you have to be willing to bet on that kind of potential. And you have to have a certain like formidable confidence that like, I know I belong here. And despite any 18, 19, 20, 30 year old telling me that like, what the heck is this 15 year old doing in here? Like you have just this rest and confidence that like, y'all don't even know, like, this isn't my last stop. This is like one of my first stops. Like I'm here and I'm here to make a difference. And, and, and that just kind of confidence, man, that, 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 that power that you can command it, it, to me, that really speaks to, uh, the principle of being an individual that like, I'm willing to bet on myself. I know the odds, yeah. I know the circumstances seem weird, but like, I'm here for a reason. And despite what anybody else thinks, despite any, um, you know, negative feedback I might get, despite any haters that are in my ear, despite anybody who's trying to discourage me, I'm here for a reason. And I'm about mm -hmm. to do what I came to do. And you can't even get to that point, and not even through that point, unless you have that kind of mindset that I'm not here for y'all's approval. I'm not here for y'all's permission. I'm here because I was supposed to be here because I have potential that I'm trying to realize uh, that is so much greater than what anybody else can see. It's it's within, I know it, and that's all, that's the only person who needs to know it is me. I know it, so I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna stand 10 toes down. That's fire, bro, that's fire. And that works both ways too, because sometimes we hold ourselves back for like the, um, the people that we think are, are greater than us or older than us, but then sometimes we hold ourselves back for the people that that are on our level, 
or that, is, that are the same age as us or from the same group as us, right? And so you've got to love your capacity for growth more than you love your comfort if you want to be all you can be in life. So I'm imagining you're 15 years old. You've got two dilemmas to face. One, I got to be around a bunch of 18, 19 year olds, and that's uncomfortable. That puts a lot of pressure on me. But also, I got to leave my buddies behind. I'm, I'm not going to get to spend all my time around the people my age. And I think it would have been totally acceptable to say, you know what? There's more to life mm -hmm. than just mm -hmm. learning and mm -hmm. getting through school mm -hmm. as fast as possible. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang back, maybe take a few electives and do a few extra projects. But I'd rather be around my, fear, my peers. I think that would have been totally acceptable. But sometimes you got to look at what's totally acceptable and say, no, I'm going to transcend that for the sake of what is ideal, for the sake of what is desirable, for the sake of what is true to my potential. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, transcend you know, is the word. Yeah. The diversity thing, too. I didn't think about that. I mean, he went to Morehouse College, but then, so so he had the all black school experience and the white school experience. Most of us only get one of those. And this brother had both. I mean, just just talk about the whole concept of preparation determines performance. That that's just one mm. of many things that that show that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let's go to lesson two. He didn't expect to become a minister or a civil rights leader. According to the New Yorker, the King family moved from Atlanta to Montgomery, Alabama when the famous 1956 bus boycott, a citywide protest against racialized segregation on public transit began. At the time, King was only 26 and pretty much unknown in activist spaces, though he had previously expressed interest in social justice. He originally, he originally opposed the boycott because he worried that it was unethical to put people's jobs at risk. However, when he realized the ultimate goal behind the protest, he volunteered to use his church's basement as a meeting spot for boycott organizers. During their first meeting, the group elected Dr. King as their president because no one else stood up to take the role. He then wrote his first public political speech in less than an hour. He then wrote his very, um, yeah, in less than an hour. In his brief 12 year career, he spoke at over 2,500 events and gave hundreds of addresses a year. Although the famed I Have a Dream speech will always hold a special place in history, it certainly wasn't the only memorable address he delivered during his life. It is estimated that between his weekly sermons at church and media, he spoke an average of 450 times per year, according to CNN. Additionally, he published six books. There's only 365 days in the year. <laughs> right. How you do 450 talks? <laughs> <laughs> right so that means you can't miss a day and then you got to squeeze in an extra one for like 100 days golly i mean you know you, you i think this also goes back um to that point uh, just about his work ethic i mean you know that's incredible i mean to be a leader you know, to be a family man, to be a a, 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 a pastor or preacher, you know, to have all of these groups of people relying on you to be there. And like you said, for this last point, it would have been completely acceptable if he would have committed to any one of those things and been, and been like, you know, this is very reasonable. Like, of course, I'm going to be here for my family. Of course, I'm going to be here for, for my church. Of course, I'm going to be here um, for any other groups. And he said, I'm going to be here for all of them. Plus, I'm going to be here for the country. I'm going to be here for the world. I'm going to show up and I'm going to give what I have to give. And I'm going to share this message um, to the point of exhaustion, to the point of, you know, probably mental breakdown, physical breakdown. Like, I mean, that if that isn't a workhorse, I don't know what is, you know, to, to the people who uh, view MLK as this God given, you know, enlightened talent that the only reason he was able to do that because he was a special person. I, I say otherwise at this point, 
I, I think both can be true, but the dude also worked, worked more than he was probably blessed. He worked just ridiculously hard. And, and I think like it kind of goes back to the vision thing for me because the, I think you, you, nobody in your circle is going to understand that kind of work ethic. Nobody, nobody's going to think it's reasonable. A lot of people are going to deem that unhealthy. They're going to deem that crazy. Um, but it's one of those things where when you get the vision, when you get the calling, when you get the idea, it's just between you and, and God at that point, it, it's, it's your fulfillment. Um, it's your calling and it was given to you for a reason. And so, to get mixed up in other people's feelings about it, to get mixed up um, in other people's doubts about it. It's, you know, I think that's interfering with you and the higher source. It's you and in, in, in your potential, you and your connection, you and what you were meant to bring. And I think, again, it, it, I mean, a lot of these success principles circle in and out his life just so, um, I mean, you know, just so great. Like, so it, it, it comes yeah. together in such a full picture and to me like not only did he do this and he pursued this vision at his own life at his own health you know at the expense of all of these things um but he he was willing to bet on himself when other people would tell him you're crazy do not do it do not do it and it goes back to what i said or what you said a couple of days ago there's a fine line between um, insanity and being a genius, like from just somebody who's in the audience watching, they both look the same. And it's not until you actually hit that mark and you make uh, your stand that you kind of get to be vindicated. And you say, look at all the success, look at what I've actually done, look at what has happened here, that you become a genius. But up until that point, yeah. people just think you're insane. Man, that's so true. That's so true. I mean, you have to be mentally resolved to know the truth of your beingness for yourself. Because there's always going to be somebody worrying about you. Always going to be somebody that's like, man, what happened to TK, man? What happened to Kamau? Like, e even when you're doing your thing, like this brother on the podcast, what he do? Like, who we think he is? Like, that's how people do, right? Because they went to high school with you. They they went to elementary school with you. So in their mind, you are whatever role they have assigned mm. to you in your story. And it takes a lot of courage to give yourself permission to outgrow the role that somebody else has assigned to you for their story. There's another lesson here too that I love, and it's about discovering and doing what makes you come alive. You, you don't need to know where you're going to end up in life in order to be a decent human being in the places you find yourself in right now. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. didn't know that he was going to become a civil rights leader. He discovered that because he made the small decision to allow his church basement to be used for a civil rights meeting. And it was in that context that he discovered, hey, this is what I need to be doing with my life. We emphasize experimentation, we emphasize meditation, we emphasize reading books, talking to people, taking personality tests. But one of the best ways to discover what your calling is in life is to make the decision to start using your gifts and talents right here, right now, to serve the people around you. And the temptation mm -hmm. is to do the opposite. The temptation is to wait on the golden opportunity before you use your gifts to serve people because who wants to waste hard work on something that isn't their calling? But your gift will make room. Your gift will make room, but you gotta use it first. And so if you find yourself in a place where you're cramped and you don't have the opportunities that you want, instead of waiting on an opportunity that gives you an excuse to be great, give yourself your own excuse by saying, you know what? I'm going to try my best to be a blessing to the people around here in whatever way I can, even if that means something like loaning them my broom, even though I don't feel proud of myself for that. That's what being a decent human being is. And that'll take you so much further than we often realize, you know? And I think if you don't even know what your gift is, if you, if you're not sure, 
you know, what is my gift? What is my call? And what am I here to do? I think if you lean on the skill sets that you do have, the things that you are kind of special in, and you take opportunities, um, and, and you take the opportunities that are given based off of what you are good at, I think you can easily, not even easily, but you will be able to find what are your gifts? You will be able to find what your callings are if you just take right. opportunities. You know, you t you take more opportunities that stretch you. You shouldn't take all the opportunities that are just comfortable and that are easy for you. But you should take some opportunities where there's there's uncertainty, and you're just like, I don't know about this one. I mean, I think <laughs> I got yeah. just enough. I got just enough to like maybe contribute here, but I'm. I, I'm definitely not coming into this thing as an expert. I'm, I'm not. I'm definitely not coming into this thing as this, you know, fantastic value add. I, I just got just enough to like be okay and 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 to do to do a decent job here. Um, and if you you walk into those opportunities, I th I think those are um, you know just just chances for you to to grow, to expand, to discover. Mm -hmm. And nobody tells you that. That's not advertised on the front of this job listing that's not advertised on the front of this business venture or um you know this idea that you're wanting to pursue it, that that's not advertised hindsight is always 20 20 20 um but those chances that you're willing to take the discovery piece is is there and and you won't know it until you do it you won't know it until you're in it but by martin luther king taking this chance you know he discovered that wow there is there's this thing out here that i feel yeah. like i really can impact that i that i have these skills that i might not even thought were my gifts but like they're needed here and they're needed in a big way and you can't count out that discovery piece it's it's so important to just take those chances and and step into opportunities mm -hmm. where you're not sure if this is the right one but you know, it's worth a try. Mm. Man, you help me, you helping me realize something right now with, with the way you're talking. And that is I, I tend to use very um, dramatic, uh, religious, mystical terminology when talking about doing what you're supposed to do. I use phrases like becoming who you're born to be phrases, like follow your calling, things like that. And that that's the space that I come from. That's my natural way of talking. But that can sound intimidating if that's not your language. And it can make it sound like in order for you to do something with conviction in life, you have to hear the heavens open and the angels sing. You have to know with absolute certainty that when God created you, he was thinking of this one specific thing. And that's not what it feels like from the inside out. You talk to people that would say of themselves, yeah, I feel like I'm doing what I'm born to do. In most cases, it's kind of like this undramatic, gradual process of discovering things like, yeah, I'm good at this. I, I don't mind doing this. It seems like when I do it, you know, people really like it. And, and over time that develops into, you know, a, a confidence that makes you look back on your life and you see those dots connect looking backwards and you go, yeah, my path really makes sense. My path really makes sense. And so I, I think that's a good way to put it. And, and the way you just said it captures Dr. King's choice so well, because they elected him president, not because the age he was when he went to college or not because he, they didn't really know who he was at the time. He wasn't known in those circles, but nobody else stood up. Nobody mm. else did. The, I'll do it. It was time to choose somebody. And I would love to have been in the room to just see what that was like. Did he get frustrated and be like, fine, I'll do it since nobody else wants to? You know, <laughs> how long was that awkward pause? Because he, he clearly was chosen because no one else would. But how many doors open up for us in life by simply being willing to do the things that no one else is willing to do? We don't have to look at ourselves as being better than other people, but there are so many clues on where our life might be pointing us when we say yes to those moments. What are the revelations on the other side of you just being willing to try things that other people are too bored by, too busy for, too intimidated by, too scared of? I think that's a, a question worth thinking about, you know? 
Yeah, and, and and it's something that I think you've really helped me come to this just very experimental mindset and and not putting so much equity or stake in the success of things that you try. Like it it really is okay to try. You know, it, it's okay yeah. to put yourself in positions that you could fail in. Um, but I think it's just the element of discovery that again is never going to be apparent or advertised or even celebrated or promoted on the front end of things. It, it, it takes an element of risk. It takes an element of chance. Um, you could say it takes even an element of luck, but I mean, the, 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 what you get from that, that process of discovery, the things that actually come about from you taking a chance are just so powerful. They're life-changing. They really are. Um, I, you know, looking back to when I was in Trader Joe's, I had no idea that I would be podcasting, you know, years later. Um, I, I didn't even, I knew that I was good at communicating and I was really good with customers and I could talk and people really enjoyed conversing with me. I had no idea this would apply to, you know, talking on a mic to a camera or talking to somebody else and holding conversations. Like I listened to podcasts at that time. I just never saw myself as that kind of person. And I think it was because I just said yes to something that felt iffy and was like, I mean, I have, I guess I have like enough of what it takes to do this. Like I'm, I'm not a great mm -hmm. value add. I'm not this perfect thing. I mean, I'm not an expert candidate, but Sure. I mean, I have enough of it. And I think it it was it's a it's very much just a process of discovery. It hasn't been the prettiest journey. It's just been small pivots to kind of come to where I'm at right now. I'm like, damn, like this is actually pretty cool. I'm actually pretty good at this. And I think it was just because I said yes. It was just because I said and it, it wasn't even like an enthused. Yes, it was kind of a reluctant. Yes, which maybe other people can relate to. Um, where it's just like, all right, like what the heck, you know, let, let's, let's try it. Yeah. You, you ever find yourself in certain jobs and, and like, there are these roles that just keep coming back at you that you never asked for, but for whatever reason, people just go to you to be the one to deal with it. So I, I've had a couple of jobs where I never asked for it, but I somehow became the angry customer guy. I, I became the guy <laughs> who like, when, when the customer's mad and wants somebody to yell at it. TK Coleman is your man. <laughs> I guess I was the resident doormat. <laughs> but man, I never asked for that. But I remember talking to my mom about that one time, just complaining about it. And I remember she said to me, she says, where God has taken you, you're going to need that. And, mm. and that hit me, man. You know, it made me start to take that seriously. And I, I really stepped into that. And I said, you know what? I want to be the guy that's unafraid to walk into the fire. And I don't know if people are choosing me for this role because they think I'm weak and they want to throw the crap job at me, or if they see something in me that I don't see, but their interpretation don't matter. The way I narrate my own story is what matters. And I'm going to mm -hmm. step into these moments and I'm going to make sure that every time I learn from something, I learn from these interactions and I learn just to be unafraid when I'm dealing with another human being who's deeply dissatisfied. And some of my most meaningful moments in life not only came from those spaces, but a lot of the things I'm able to do in my current work just comes from what I have learned about communication. I've learned about listening, just from being in those moments that didn't seem like it was related to my purpose, but, but you gotta have that ability to make those connections, you know, before anybody Definitely. else makes them for and hopefully you got somebody in your life who helped you do that too. You know, let's go to number three. He was considered to be a radical and a rabble rouser. Throughout the 1960s, the scope of Dr. King's activism work went well beyond civil rights and into economic justice. He increasingly used his platform to advocate for causes like guaranteed annual income and health care. But he also vocalized his strong opposition to the Vietnam War, which caused was a significant amount of American approval, according to Jen M. Jackson's MLK feature for Teen Vogue. I think there are certain people who have this aura or this image 
of being loved by everybody. And a lot of us have at least at one time in our lives, they say something to us like, be like so-and-so. Everybody likes them. And what I have discovered is that if you think you're liked by everyone, of this I am sure, you just haven't gotten out enough. You just haven't met enough people. Your network is too small. Because for starters, if everybody likes you, I promise you there's at least one person who hates you for that reason. Right? They hate you because mm. everybody likes you. you know? but, but even apart from that, there are plenty of people out there who hate you the moment you start talking just because the way you sound, just because the way you put it together, because of the way you look, because of the places that you come from, because you remind them of their ex-boyfriend or their ex-girlfriend, you remind them of their father or a student that they hate it. Like, there's so many complicated things going on. And then you have a worldview, whether you study or not, whether you consider yourself a thought leader or not, you have lots of different opinions. And some of your opinions, people are going to be like, yeah, that's right, man. I got people who, when I talk about education, they love me. And then the moment I start talking about MJ and LeBron, they hate me. And there's no escaping from that, right? We're going to have opinions and convictions that make people love us. And then the moment they hear us talk about a different thing, oh, I hate you. And that's something that Dr. King dealt with in his own life as well. And so a lot of these heroes or icons or role models we look up to, when we strive to be like people, it's important to remember that part of being like them is being ready for the hate and the misunderstanding, the disagreement and the criticism that's going to come along with that calling. We talk a lot about following your calling, discovering and doing what makes you come alive, but what makes you come alive is going to irritate some other people. It's going to disrupt and threaten things that other people have going on. And they're gonna hate you for that. They're gonna defy you for that. They're gonna resist you for that. But that too is a part of the calling. It's not just, hey, share your gifts and your insights with the world so they can enjoy it. It's also open yourself up to the vulnerability that all creators must face in the form of, I hate you for what you believe. I hate you for what you represent. You know, I, I was thinking about this as you were talking, and I, I, I think to to evolve to like the best version of yourself, I, I, th I think it's important that you do have a certain, um, you know, formidableness to your mindset that I'm not worried about the haters and naysayers. I think that that is a crucial element. But I'm also of the belief that feedback is is good, um, that yep. especially if you're in business, you know, like what your customers are telling you, if they're angry with your product, like it is good to listen. It, it, it's the thing that's going to keep you in business and it's going to be the thing that allows you to pivot. I think the same way, you know, when it comes to personal development, like I I actually don't mind putting myself out there. I like putting myself out there. I like hearing my own vulnerabilities and and figuring out like what how people are perceiving me and and everybody doesn't share that a lot of people don't care and they say you know screw you i'm just going to be me i don't care so but so i think there's there's two s ways that you can approach that again i lean on the side the side of um you know receptivity and being open to to what people have to say about me however this is kind of the important um part to remember that i just got reminded earlier this week is that you don't you you get to choose which feedback you want to implement the the power is yours that it's it's on you to make that decision not everybody uh nobody gets to make that decision on how you're implementing the feedback how uh you know what are the things that you're prioritizing um and and you know what are the things that that actually matter to you like it it is good to hear it is awareness is a good thing no one what's out there no one you know how your message is landing knowing how you're being perceived knowing the success of yourself as a leader as a thinker as a but it's all really you get to make that decision for yourself you get to make the decision are these things worth it to me are these things important enough for me to actually make change. Yeah, man, I think you definitely have to have 
a well thought out standard for criticism, who you're going to receive it from, how you're going to evaluate it, and what action steps you're going to take in response to it. Because there are always two possibilities with criticism that you want to be able to give an account for. One of those possibilities is that this person criticizing you is seeing legit blind spots. And no matter how mm. off base their criticism sounds to you, they're hitting on something that you need to take a look at and do something about. That's always a possibility. Sure. The second is that this person who's criticizing you, they don't know what they're talking about. That doesn't sound very nice, but that's always a possibility. And the reason I know that for a fact is because there's a lot of stuff out there where I don't know what I'm talking about. And I have criticized people about things where I didn't know what I was talking about. So that happens sometimes. I'm proof of that. And sometimes people might even know what they're talking about concerning many things. But when it comes to the places you're trying to go, the things you're trying to do, those may not be areas where they've demonstrated competency or success. And it doesn't mean you got to be disrespectful in order to disagree, but you got to know how you got to be discerning. How are you going to parcel that out? You know, and it can be easy to commit one of two extremes in an effort to protect your ego and solidify your, your self identity. You can just be like, I'm not going to listen to anybody, but me, I know who I am. I'm just going to do me. And if you got any feedback, you can yeah. go where the yeah. sun don't shine. And that never helps. And then the other extreme is to be like, well, no matter who you are and what you say, um, I should be nice about this and I should thank you for it and I should receive it and I should go away and think about it. And you got to have a BS detector too so that you know when a conversation is a waste of your time. And if you have not defined that, like you have to define that based on your principles and your preferences and priorities based on those three Ps. If you haven't defined what kind of conversation is a waste of time, then you are guaranteed to waste your time. You know, you're guaranteed let other people waste your time. But yeah, anyway, that's just kind of a follow up on on some stuff you're making me think about with what we do with with criticism. For sure. I think for me, my closing thoughts on Dr. King and what we can learn from him. It it's it's really about the open mindedness and humility of a man who sees every responsibility set before him as work that matters. And we live in a culture where work that matters is typically defined by the job, the company, the organization, the title, or the paycheck. But mm -hmm. you can also be the kind of person who sees work that matters as being defined by the spirit in which you do it attitude and enthusiasm you bring to it and the sense of creativity that you use to expand that role beyond anybody's previously held expectations for what that role will deliver. And I think Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered that compellingly from his work at the, as a newspaper boy, becoming the youngest assistant manager, to him becoming the president of a civil rights group just because no one else will do it. He lived a very young life. We didn't get the chance, unfortunately, to see what he would have been like as an old man. He not only proved that you can do great things when you're young, but he lived such a concentrated dosage of life that he proved that if that's all you got, you can make it count. And for those of us who might be blessed to have more years, we certainly can at least do do something along those lines to make our lives count. And the great thing is, it doesn't have to be glamorous. It doesn't have to be glamorous. If there's anything we take from him, it's not we can all be famous too. It's rather we can all do whatever we do, like he said, as if it's the most important job in the world. Even if you're the street sweeper, we can do it with pride. Mm. Yeah, I think my closing, closing remarks heart back on on one point that i've found looking at all of these really um just remarkable influential figures and then another point that i think is is not just unique to martin luther king but you know he really embodies the spirit that i wouldn't have previously thought about him before doing kind of this deep uh this deep dive the first point is that you know the truth will set you free is that there's nothing like that pursuit to truth 
um, everybody's truth is different. Um, everybody has different takes and perspectives on your truth, but your commitment to evolving and realizing uh, your own truth and the truth that is most compelling to the people that you serve is, I think the thing that's going to speak the loudest, the thing that's going to serve the most people, the thing um, that is really going to, you know, guide your life like a compass. If, if you are always following the truth, then you know you're never going to get lost because uh, I don't know if it's our intuition or if it's our soul or if it's just, you know, the things that we bring to this world. But most times we know what is true. We know where we're leaning towards. We know what feels right and what is the direction to go. Now, whether we have the courage to pursue that or not, that that's a different conversation. That's a different um, thing that you need to build up and to, de and to develop. But we do know where truth lies most of the time. And Martin Luther King followed that to the very last day, um, to, to, to literally his death. And I think, you know, you talk about changing the world, you talk about leaving a legacy, you talk about, you know, realizing your individual potential and, and becoming the best version of yourself. I think truth is the path. So, you know, that, that, that is abundantly clear when looking at his life. I think the second point is that, to me, it's just incredibly impressive that Martin Luther King at such a young age found himself in so many positions and opportunities of leadership where he was able to step into spaces that one, he probably wasn't welcome um, Two, he probably wasn't fully ready for, um, you know, and that three, he, he probably had a step into that space despite any fears um but what he ended up doing was betting on himself betting bet on yourself bet on yourself martin luther king bet on himself he bet bigger than anybody else he and 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 <laughs> i think nobody's going to know your potential everybody's going to try to tell you how much potential you have or you do not have they don't know the answers though you know the answers. You, you know you you should feel your your gauge of potential. Um, it doesn't have to be as great as Martin Luther King. It doesn't have to be, and when I mean great, I mean it doesn't have to be as glamorous. It doesn't have to be as um, you know as as big and famous and in this or that. Like your level of potential should be driven by the impact that you want to make. Um, and, and they should go in parallel, but if you're not willing to bet on yourself, it doesn't even matter. You won't even realize that you won't even get the chance to get to that point. If you're not willing to take some risks, if you're not willing to be criticized, if you're not willing to step into spaces, um, that are, are foreign to you. And, you know, I think the people who win, um, in whatever capacity financially, uh, you know, entrepreneurially, um, you know, in any, any other kind of space that you can name, the people who win are the people who are going to bet on themselves. Um, and, and, and just whatever that means for you in your life, do it, do it, do, do it, bet on yourself, take the courage, take the step, take the risk, take the chance. Um, it'll be worth it. Word to the word to the wise come out. And for those of you who are listening and thinking, uh, but TK, uh, Dr. King was not a capitalist or he was not a this or that or whatever it is, just plug in your favorite label. To that, I say, hey, look, I got problems with all of y'all, but I still learn from you. So let us do that for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Please just let us do that, please. If y'all have any questions or any comments, please leave them in the comments section. And if there's anybody you want us to talk about, any suggestions you want to make, don't hesitate to let us know. We'd like to hear from you. Please hit the like button. Please hit the subscribe button. Please share this episode with a family member or friend that you think might enjoy the conversation or learn something from it. Kamal, my brother, it's always a pleasure hanging out with you and talking to you, man. That's probably the best reason to be doing this show. I just get to kick it with you. And for all y'all who are listening.
appreciate y'all tuning in and supporting the revolution of one. Don't forget to individualize the revolution of your own life. Peace.